Welcome to part six of our journey through biological psychology. We're going to look at the brain stem and the limbic system in this section. So jumping right in. The brain stem is the oldest part of your brain. We say oldest because it was the oldest part to develop like evolutionary as we as we developed. Um, we share the brain stem with a lot of other mammals, uh, even reptiles. We sometimes call it the reptilian brain. So your um, brain stem is actually where the spinal cord comes up and then it kind of bulges here as it enters your brain, right? So it's this old part right here. It does some very basic stuff without our consciousness, right? And these different parts of it, we'll talk about it. <clears throat> right when it right when it begins to bulge there at the end, so your spinal cord comes up, you have this little bitty bulge here. This part here is called the medulla. Alright? And the medulla is responsible for basic, basic stuff like your heartbeat. and breathing, right? Stuff we don't even think about, we just do, right? Um, so we can have brain damage to different parts of our brain, we're still gonna breathe, and we're still gonna have a heartbeat. Something happens to our spinal cord right there at the base of our neck, right? You watch the movies where the guys snap people's necks, that's why they die instantly, because their brain stem has been, their brain's been severed from the rest of their body, their brain stem, where their medulla uh, is located, controls their heart, breathing, breathing, that's over. So uh, that's one of the reasons why they instantly die, whereas, you know, you you might have a guy even get shot in the head and still survive if they get shot up here in this part of the brain because it's not as vital to the just your existence, right? Now your pons is located directly above the medulla. Your pons is, excuse me, uh, this section right here on your medulla, so your medulla is right, just bulges a little bit, so your pons is just a little bit out here. And your pons is uh, helps coordinate movement and that's pretty much its major function, it helps coordinate movement, right? Um, blinking our eyes, basic stuff that we don't think about. Um, your cerebellum is, let's change colors here for the cerebellum. The cerebellum at the back. It's like that thing that looks almost like a little mini brain. It's actually, cerebellum li literally means little brain. Oops, not little brain, little brain. Um, and so it's responsible for coordinated movements. And it's also responsible for processing sensory information. So um, some of the, sometimes when we're taking in senses, and we're, that's eventually going to go to the thalamus, which is up here. But um, some of that information from the thalamus is sent down, I should, I should put it that way, sent down to the cerebellum to help coordinate your movements. Um, so if you're sensing that you need to move to the left because a car is coming or you feel a person coming, that sensory information might have been sent to the thalamus, which we'll talk about in a second, and then move to the cerebellum, which will help coordinate that movement. Um, <clears throat> really amazing athletes uh, rely heavily on their cerebellum to coordinate some of their moves. I think of a soccer player who can do tricks with the ball as they're dribbling the ball downfield, their cerebellum is definitely working as they're doing that. Um, your reticular formation is basically, we don't know a lot about it, so your brain stem right was like this again, this little bulge here, goes down to your spinal cord. Um, your pons was up here, like this, and this reticular formation kind of goes down right through the middle. Um, it's not really well known what it does, because we haven't been able to do experiments on humans and uh, this experiments on animals are kind of lacking but the reticular formation uh, helps regulate arousal and like arousal we a lot of times talk about your sleep wake 
and also what you're paying attention to, right? So one of the theories of why it's in the brainstem is it helps us pay attention and perhaps helps us distinguish from our environment what to pay attention to, what to be aroused to, what can help us stay alive, as it were. So that would be your reticular formation. It's just kind of in the middle there. <clears throat> Finally, we've got our thalamus. Our thalamus is kind of an important one. The thalamus is um, literally means a little room. Or I'm sorry, not little room. That's the cerebellum. Literally means inner room. Okay. Oh, that's a nice N there. Inner room. And so basically, the thalamus is like a switchboard. All the sensory information you get from, and here, here's your thalamus up here. Okay, this is the, actually called the midbrain or the limbic system, but your thalamus is located right up here in this area. Your thalamus is about the size of, a, between a walnut and an egg. It's on both sides of your brain. And your thalamus, all the sensory information goes to your thalamus. I kind of think of it like a box here. All this information goes in. It's like a switchboard, like I think one of those old switchboards um, when telephones were first introduced in the world and you had a lady sitting at the switchboard and she'd go, who are you calling? She'd take the plug and plug it into another spot and send your information <clears throat> and send that signal going somewhere else. It's kind of what the thalamus does. It takes that sensory information here and then decides where it wants to send it. So almost all sensory information except for your sense of smell, interestingly enough, goes through your thalamus. Your sense of smell actually goes directly to your olfactory um, cortex, um, which is one of the reasons why your sense of smell, your olfactory cortex is actually really close to your hippocampus. You may remember that your hippocampus is responsible for helping to form memories. And so you may remember that your sense of smell is also very strongly, the most strong uh, sense that's um, connected with our memories. And when you smell something, you can instantly be transported back. So that's just a little aside, but your senses go to the thalamus here, and then the thalamus then sends that information to different places. It may send it to the cerebellum over here. <clears throat> it may help uh, send it even down to your medulla. Um, right? If it says your medulla, it might tell you you see a tiger heart start pumping faster. Okay. Right, <clears throat> your cerebellum might it might tell it to your cerebellum we need to start running we need to get out of here, so it's going to send it to different places. Um, it also taking that information, it also receives information from higher brain functions. So the stuff out here, the cerebral cortex, which we'll get to in the next uh, lecture, it receives that information and then it might tell you what to do with it. So it might receive information and then send it out. Um, so <clears throat> it's taking it both ways. It's coming from higher t brain functions that might send out. It might just take sensory information and send it out the other way. Three more terms here. We've got the limbic system. So the limbic system um, literally means like in between. Limbus, in between. So it's in between the old brain stem and the newer neocortex out here, or your cortex, right? And it deals a lot with your emotions which and uh, arousal. Your amygdala, as uh, again, we talked about this in the memory chapter, your amygdala is a link to emotion, uh, especially emotions related to aggression and fear. They actually did a study with, uh, with cat. They... <clears throat> Um, lesioned, I think, part of the amygdala, or they stimulated, they stimulated part of the amygdala, and the cat would immediately put its back back up and get ready to attack. They, they move the little uh, stimulation just a little bit over, and the cat would then cower in the corner. So the amygdala is responsible with, for emotions, especially aggression and fear. We tie it to that. It's not, it's actually a, a brain part that's still trying to be understood, as, is, as they all are. They're not completely 100% understood, but it's, it's getting better. Um, it also works with your frontal lobe to make judgments. 
So <clears throat> the amygdala, so your frontal lobe's up here, right? Something like that. The amygdala will send information to the frontal lobe, will tell you how to feel, right? Uh, I feel scared. Well, your frontal lobe helps make judgments, and your frontal lobe will then coordinate with the emotions of the amygdala to tell you what to do. Should I run? Should I stay? Should I, you know, suck it up? What's, what should, how should I act to this? So they often work in conjunction and how you should appropriately act. The hypothalamus, hypo literally means below, so it's just this the structure this below the thalamus, hypothalamus, hypo below thalamus. And the hypothalamus is responsible for the four Fs. <clears throat> um, the four Fs are flight or fight or flight. All right, flight or flight fight here, since I started with that. Fight or flight, one F, two Fs. Food, it helps regulate your hunger and sex. So the four Fs here, fight or flight, food and sex, if you can get the four Fs out of that. Um, it, what, what the hypothalamus is actually doing is it's also monitoring your blood chemistry and it's deciding when, it's getting, sending triggers out to perhaps your pituitary gland on when to release chemicals and into the endocrine system, which we talked about earlier. And will help govern your <clears throat> reward or pleasure centers of your brain. So for instance, they did these studies with rats actually, and they <clears throat> stimulated part of the thalamus and the rats would literally uh, press a, like a lever 7,000 times per minute until they finally passed out from exhaustion because they wanted to continue to receive that stimulus to their thalamus which was their pleasure center, <clears throat> which we actually, with animals, we call it reward center because we don't really know if it's pleasurable or not. We can't, we're putting human emotions on rats there. Um, in, in addition, these rats would also cross over an electrical grid. So they go from over here, cross the electrical grid, this thing's got ele kind of electricity flowing through it, right? Super, super uncomfortable. Cross it if they're, to know if they're gonna get, receive stimulation if they get to the other side. So really interesting stuff with the hypothalamus, uh, what happens if you um, activate it. <clears throat> and then the hippocampus is um, helps in forming our memories as we've talked about before. It's all about memory. Um, I don't know, I, I come up with this funny little thing that hippos have great memories. I don't know if they do or not, but <clears throat> hippos have great memories and that helps me remember that the hippocampus has to do with memory. All right, so that's all it for today. Um, next time we'll come back and we'll look at the cerebral cortex. Thanks.